brothers and sisters, uh, to today's presentation about uh, laying the foundation of the church. And in this presentation I want to show you many different uh, evidences that place the laying of the foundation of God's church right here at the Midnight Cry. And then yeah, the building or the church is fully raised up here at the final review. And it's an important topic, as we will see, to understand where to place this correctly on our line in order then to have a correct understanding um, what the Lord is about to do. So let's turn first to Matthew 12, verses 39 to 40, because here Christ speaks about the sign of Jonah. And he says, obviously, I will give you no sign but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then in verse 40 he says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, based upon many, many studies, we understand that the belly of the whale experience is right here in the chasm when Jonah faces death here and Christ himself he likens him to, uh, to Jonah and says like Jonah was these three days and three nights in the belly so will the son of man be in the grave and when he stands he is then the cross where he dies on Passover then the second day he rested in the grave and the third day he resurrected again on the first day of first fruits. So let's go now to John chapter 12, uh, sorry, John chapter 2, as a, another story where the same thing is basically illustrated. In John chapter 2, verse 19 to 21. Here Christ speaks to the Pharisees and says the following Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was the temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So he is referring to the exact same three days as in Matthew 12, when he spoke about the sign of the prophet Jonah, and says, Destroy this temple which was his body, it says here in verse 21, on the cross when he died and in three days he raised it up again. Okay, So here we see a nice illustration yeah, that these three days is the raising up of God's temple. Okay, And obviously it's, it's a no-brainer. You always start with laying the foundation at the beginning. So when in these three days the temple is raised up and it's completed here at the third day, uh, the beginning must be here where the foundation is laid. So I already marked this down here and we will confirm this with many other scripture. Foundation laid. And here, uh, temple completed. All right, so let's continue. Let's go now to the book of Joel. And we want to read in the book of Joel, uh, the chapter 1, verses 2 to verse 5. And here he stands right here also at the midnight cry, as we will see. And he now gives a warning to this present generation and refers them back to the days of the fathers and asks, has this been in the days of your fathers? And he gives this warning that they are then to, you know, to proclaim down to four generations. So let's look at this. Hear this, ye old man, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Have this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? 
Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. So we clearly see you know, Joel is basically Samuel Snow and he gives the midnight cry and says, Awake ye drunkards. You know, he's calling those lost sheep to awake now. So he's standing here, gives this warning down here. But he's referring back to the fathers, right? So he's basically uh, showing what happened here. And when you would read the next verses, he says, There's this nation come upon the land, right? Which is the king of the north that you now devoured everything here and uh, destroyed everything. And he then gives this warning to these people here. So this a similar illustration you find in the book of Zechariah, where also Zechariah is raised up. And he also gives a warning to this present generation, but he's referring back to the days of the fathers and reminds them not to repeat the same sins of the fathers. So let's go to Zechariah chapter 1 and let us read um, verses 1 to verse 4. It says, In the eighth month, in the second year of the rise, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been so displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings, but they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. So it's a, it's a similar illustration as in the book of Joel. Zechariah also stands here and he is now referring back to the sins of the fathers and now warns them not to commit the same sins. And when you turn now, jump over the next couple of verses and come down to verse 8, it says the following, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were red horses speckled in white. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. So, <clears throat> yeah, so here's now, he sees now this man standing on the, on the, under the myrtle trees, and he sees these four horses, and he wants to know what these horses mean. And they are then those powers, basically, that ran to and fro uh, through the whole earth, uh, as it is written here in verse 10. And then in verse 11, And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees, and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on these cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? So <clears throat> we understand uh, we have many how longs marked here at the Sunday law, but uh, when, you, when you understand fractals, we know that this is the big fractal and the same. Um, symbols in a sense uh, you have here you also find here 
Yeah, so you have a how long here based on different um, prophetic illustrations, for instance, Daniel 8. He asks how long shall God's people be trodden down by the daily and the papacy. But Zechariah puts the how long right here at the midnight cry. And he asks the question how long. And he asks, uh, or he refers them back and says, the Lord had indignation in the past for 70 years. Now we understand 70 is nothing else than the 1260. And this year is the last week of Christ. So we have the 1260 here and the 1260 here. So basically we have the 70 year in the 70 year. And this story here gives us the 70 right here. Because it says here that these four uh, horses, they went uh, to and fro through, through the earth here prior to the midnight cry and uh, accomplished them this work right here. And so they came to a halt right here. And uh, this you can study this out, and it's a deep study, and I don't profess to fully understand it yet. But uh, you have another illustration of some other power that walks to and fro right here in this time. We can turn to Job chapter 1 to look at this. Job chapter 1, because... This is where Satan now appears before the Lord. And when he first appears, we understand this is right here at the Sunday law. Right? So he's right here at the Sunday law, coming now before the Lord and claiming God's people or Job as his prey. So let's read verse 6 and 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So when he comes down here before the Lord the first time, he says, uh, I was walking to and fro through the earth. Right? So past tense. So before that, uh, he was walking up and down, or walking to and fro in the earth. So we know and when you would look at the way mark before that, this would be this civil Sunday law. So here he's walking to and fro through the earth. And in Zechariah this walking down to and fro was connected with the 70. So this gives you also 70 or 1260 from the um, civil Sunday law to the Sunday law. And um, which is also totally in harmony when you look at the bigger fractal of the last week of Christ from, from the civil Sunday law to the final review, you also have then 1260 here and the 1260 here, uh, or 70 here and the 70 here. So this gives you the 70 right here where Satan you know, walks to and fro through the earth in this time here and then appears before the Lord the first time. But we know that he appears the second time before the Lord, right here, for the second test that starts here, when Job is tested upon his own life. And when he comes here the second time, he again says the same thing. When you go to uh, Job chapter 1, and then to, uh, sorry, Job chapter 2, And then um, verse 1 and 2. It says, Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And so here we see... Yeah, but here he's also walking to and fro through 
through the earth. Uh, and he then appears before the Lord the second time. So, I don't have time now to show this in this study, but you can clearly show when you go to Zechariah chapter 6, as these, these chariots or these horses are these four winds you know, that get loosed and restrained. And this is Satan who is allowed to walk up and down through the whole earth when he's loose, but he's also always restrained because the Lord restrained Satan here, right? He said, don't touch Job, only his belongings and his family you can touch. And here, he also put a restraint upon Satan. And he was now allowed to touch Job's uh, life, but he was not allowed to kill him. So, but we can see that Satan increased in power. So, because the the winds are more and more allowed to strike as we go down the history. Alright, so my point is, when we come back to Zechariah chapter 1, is you can see, right, that the 70 years here in Zechariah 1 ends here at the midnight cry, when those four horses, um, we have this number four here, right, leading down to the midnight cry, um, uh, come out to a rest and they walked to and fro through the earth in this time period here from the Sunday law to the midnight cry and then in verse 13 the Lord answers to this question how long and the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words so the angel that communed with me said unto me cry thou saying thus saith the Lord of hosts I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. And so here, now the Lord says, my house shall be now built after these 70 years. And we understand the 70 years that is referring to here in Zechariah was the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. So one illustration, these 70 years end here at the midnight cry. You know, you also have the big fragment where it goes to the final review. But in this illustration, it ends here at the midnight cry. And the end of the 70 was the first decree by Cyrus. So, and the first decree by Cyrus, I write it down here, first decree, uh, was the decree to build God's house up again. Right? So, uh, therefore here the foundation is laid under the first decree of Cyrus. Now he says, my house shall be built. And it says in verse 16, also that a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. And when you go to chapter 2, you can see it's to measure Jerusalem. And the measurement is this judgment. This in, and we understand this is the investigative judgment of the living, where Jerusalem is measured. Okay. Well, let's turn now to Isaiah 28, verse 16. Just to show uh, that this foundation that is laid is also connected to a stone, to a foundation stone. Let us read verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So when the Lord now lays here this foundation, it's this foundation stone that he lays. Okay. So. And when you believe in this foundation that he lays right here at the midnight cry, you will not make haste. Yeah. So you, you will tarry, you will continue to tarry here all the way along until the end when he delivers you. So you can already see that something, this foundation has something to do with what the Lord is doing here, right here at the midnight cry. 
And obviously, uh, what he's giving here at the, at the beginning, at the minute cry, is this great exceeding light, right? this exceeding bright light. So this is basically what, what lays the foundation for your future walk, that, you, that the Lord can raise up this, this temple here um, at the end. Okay, so that's this, what builds you up, is this light. And so the midnight cry is basically this foundation at the beginning that he lays down, and you must hold fast to it and you will not make haste. But we understand that they walk up here this narrow path and those that lose the sight of the foundation of this light at the beginning of the path, they rashly deny the light behind them and fall down in the wicked world below. So they make haste, they rashly deny the light. Okay, so understanding that this foundation is also connected with this foundation stone, you can bring in this other story uh, that is the story by or, or of Jacob in Genesis 28, where you can see that uh, he also here at the midnight cry lays the foundation of God's house. Let's read verse 10 and 11. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took off the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down on that place to sleep. So we can see uh, he's right here at the Sunday law because he now is tearing, and marks the tearing time here, and he goes to sleep. Like the virgins that now slept right here. And he takes as a pillow a stone. But now when you jump down to verse 18, and Jacob rose up early in the morning, so he now awakes. The virgins go to sleep here, and they awake right here at the midnight cry. And now he takes the stone. It says, and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. So here you can see that he now takes the stone when he awakes, and now he anoints the stone. Right, so. We clearly can show that we will receive this anointing here, that this exceeding bright light is an anointing that the Lord will give us. In verse 19, and he called the name of that place Bethel, which means house of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed the vow, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way, that I will go, and that's this narrow way that we that have to go, right? And will give me bread to eat the message and raiment to put on the righteousness of Christ, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar right here when he wakes up, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Unto thee. So he lays the foundation here and says, If the Lord will keep me in this way, and I will return to, to my father's house in peace, when he finally arrives, then he will make this stone to God's house. And so he's in the temple built. Okay? So it's a nice illustration to again show that here the foundation is laid. Well, with other clear evidences for this. And when you go to the reform lines, we understand that each of those boxes here, we can take and place it here in the binding off. So when you look at the middle box here of the reform lines, and so from here to here, and you take this box and put it right here from the Sunday law, to the final review in the effect of every vision. And I just picked now three clear lines to show that here in the middle way mark then, you know, which would be here this one, is always the foundation laid. So for instance in um, in the timeline of the three decrees, 
Uh, you have, for instance, Cyrus, the first decree, and the rise, the second decree here. But in the middle, you have the foundation of the temple laid. Or in the, uh, in the line of Christ, you would have the baptism, and then the marriage of Cana, and then the first temple cleansing. So, in, in the marriage of Cana, Sister White says, he took five disciples with him that represented the foundation of the Christian church. So also the foundation laid then right here. And also when you go to the time of the Millerites, you have 1840 here, 1842 here, and in the year 1842 the, the chart, the 1843 chart was produced. And Sister White says it was the Rock of Ages, and you have this stone or this rock here, the Rock of Ages, and she says that's the, the foundation where, upon which we have built ever since. And then April 19th. So uh, this box here would be this box in the middle way mark is then this middle way mark. And you have three clear illustration, illustrations of the foundation being laid here in the middle way mark. Okay, so... And let's go now to Zechariah chapter 4, because also in Zechariah, you know, this laying of the foundation is illustrated. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1, and let's read down to verse 3. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. So here you also see Zechariah being woken up here. Basically, you can show that I haven't proved every chapter yet, but most of the chapters you can clearly show all are located at the midnight cry. Maybe every chapter I haven't uh, looked at this yet, but. From chapter 1 to chapter 6, all of those chapters are at the midnight cry. Okay, so, and here we can see he wakes out of the sleep, he wakes up, he's a virgin, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereupon, there, thereon, sorry, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. And the two olive trees by it, and upon the right side of the bowl, no, the, and the other upon the left side. So he sees the candlestick with the two olive trees. And when you jump down to verse 11 to verse uh, 14, he explains what these two olive trees are. In verse 11, then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? In verse 14, it's explanation. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So, and when you go to Revelation 11, it's the two witnesses, right? These two old trees. So basically, he wakes up and he sees the two anointed ones, or the two witnesses, right here, marked. and Christ in the middle. Okay, I just put this down because shortly we will come back to this. But when you now go, go to Zechariah 4, verse 7 to 10, because these verses we skipped, there's now something inserted with all this here, what we read before about this candlestick and the two anointed ones and uh, these two olive trees. It says the following, verses 7 to 10. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. And so now, in between the story of the candlestick and the two anointed ones, is, is this story about um, Zerubbabel that is now facing this great mountain. 
Um, so, and we understand this great mountain that we face here in the, in the Midnight Cry period is basically these giants, that is Goliath or the giants at the at Kadesh Barnea, where they didn't want to enter into the glorious land because of these giants. Yeah. And we understand the mountain, this great mountain, or these giants, or is this image of a beast, uh, which is Babylon. And in Jeremiah 51, Babylon is called this great burning mountain. But it says here that this great mountain, uh, these giants, shall be kind of plain, because it says everybody who exalts himself here will be abased. Right? So, <clears throat> let's go now to verse 8. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of, the, of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. So here we see uh, that um, when the midnight cry, when Zechariah wakes, wakes up here, he sees now Zer, uh, Zerubbabel, he laying the foundation and he gets the promise to also finish it. Yeah. And he must only not look at this mountain but believe the promises. And then it goes on to say, um, verse 10, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. So, uh, this is then this day of small um, things, uh, because at the beginning it's a very small, it's a little praying company, right, that begins this work here under the Midnight Cry. But yeah, we must not get discouraged because of this, but believe uh, that this is the way how the Lord ordained it. It's the day of small things, the day of small beginnings. Uh, and he will perform a great work with his little print company and he will build the house. And uh, it says then here that um, there's this plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. And these seven are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Well, what is these seven? Let's go to Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9. It says, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, and one stone shall, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. So here we have this seven eyes, which is also mentioned here in Zechariah 4, verse 10. And it's upon a stone, it's this foundation stone that is laid here, and it has upon it these seven eyes. And in Zechariah 4, verse 10, it says, it were the eyes of the Lord, that run to and fro through the whole earth. And you can show, maybe we just quickly go there, uh, Revelation chapter 4, I think it is. Or maybe chapter 5, let's see. That's chapter 5, verse 6, Revelation 5, verse 6. what these um, seven eyes are. It says, And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. So the seven eyes of the Lord are the seven spirits of the Lord. And when you then go to Revelation 4, verse 5, it says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So the seven eyes are the seven spirits of God, but the seven spirits of God are the lamps on the candlestick. Okay, so, and we understand the candlestick, according to Revelation 1, verse 20, represents God's church. And so it's in these seven churches you can find, that you can also find in the book of Revelation. Now, they are these eyes of the Lord that run 
to and fro through the whole earth. So we must understand uh, as Satan is walking to and, fro, uh, to and fro through the whole earth, but also God's eyes, God's church. So you have a true work of God's people and you have this counterfeit destructive work done by Satan or his people. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going on simultaneously. And, um, and basically, you, know, you must then determine which work is it referring to. Okay, so, but we see that here again, you know, for the foundation is this stone laid with the seven eyes of the Lord upon it, which is his church, right? It's the foundation of his church is laid here, and it's the foundation of these seven churches, which represents the whole Church of the Lord. Okay, so another nice proof to show that the foundation is laid here. Let's go now to Zechariah chapter 5. And because whenever there's a true, there's also a counterfeit. We already saw with Satan, he walks to and fro through the whole earth, but also God's eyes, God's church, does the same thing. And <coughs> Yeah, when the Lord lays his true foundation here at the midnight cry, Satan will lay his counterfeit foundation. And to read about it, let's go to Zechariah chapter 5. Okay, so basically in Zechariah chapter 5, it's the same, still the same vision of chapter 4. You can just go through it yourself. Uh, he wakes up here in chapter 4, at the midnight cry, then he sees the, the candlestick with the two olive trees. And then the next thing he sees in the same vision is in chapter 5, the flying roll. Right? So and we understand the flying roll is also the finger of God. Right? And we understand uh, when you look at the line of Moses, uh, if you look at the last box of the line of Moses, you have the ten plagues in here. And here in this box you have the first three, and then the finger of God marked here at the midnight cry, and then the seven last plagues right here. Right? So we would have then three here, the finger of God, which is the flying roll, and then the seven last plagues. Illustrated here, or typified then here. Okay, so, but then if you go down to Zechariah 5 verse 5, it's still the same vision. Yeah, so he's still here at the midnight cry where he sees all these things. So let's see now what he is shown here, beginning in verse 5. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what this, sorry, what is this that goeth forth? And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. And Ifa is this measuring pot, basically, that they used back then. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the Ifa. So the Ifa was covered with a lead, and in the Ifa was sitting this woman. And he said, this is wickedness, because a woman, we understand, represents a church or a doctrine, right? So this is now this wicked, satanic doctrine that is in the midst of the ephah, covered with the lead. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted up my eyes, and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ether between the earth and the heaven. So here we see now two women yeah, on either side of this ether, and they now carry this ether between heaven and earth. And these women, they have wings like a stork, and we understand the stork is an unclean animal, so it's also two impure women on either side of it. Right? So, and we understand basically at the end of the world you have three entities, the beast, uh, the dragon, and the false prophet, right? And 
here you also have three women and but in the middle is this this ephah and this wickedness this woman is in this ephah and we understand uh, you have here in chapter 4 you the Lord showed us the true two anointed one the two witnesses basically are standing on either side of the Lord of the candlestick and here you have now the counterfeit you have the, the two un or impure women standing on either side of this ether and carrying it now and in the middle you have this wicked doctrine and if you just show this because the two annoying ones sister white says replaced satan in heaven in his position and satan was a covering cherub so they are covering cherubs and when you go into the sanctuary you know that you have the ark of the covenant And on either side, you have these, I just illustrated now like this, because I'm not the best um, in drawing, okay, or not the best artist. So, on either side you had a cherub, and in the middle was God's presence, right, which kind of glory. And in the Ark is the Ten Commandments. So, four and six, the two tables of stone. So basically, this is the true, but Satan has this counterfeit. Right? He has the two false women, the two false anointed ones. And in the middle, in this ephah, is now this wickedness. This woman, uh, it's Satan, it's Satan's law, because this ether is this false ark of the covenant, and, uh, and uh, basically he has his own false law. For instance, if you go to the French Revolution, right, they made these two tables of stone with a human rights on it. It's, it's his false law that he puts in place, his humanism, that's his foundation of government compared to the Lord's foundation of government. And this you can now see going on here in verse 10 and 11 it says, Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Yeah, so own base or own foundation. So also the counterfeit is laid right here at the midnight cry where Zechariah sees it and Satan builds his own base or foundation for his church and his wicked people that he you know fully raises up here. So <clears throat> therefore you, know, you have another illustration also the counterfeit marks the foundation being laid here and um, it's interesting that this ephah is lifted up between heaven and earth, right? So, we understand Christ on the cross was lifted up here between heaven and earth. So, it's this counterfeit message of the cross that Satan will also bring in here to deceive us. Okay, so it's very important to see this that Satan will really do everything to deceive us. Okay. So, having put this in place, let's go to two further stories and then we can come to close. It says here in Luke chapter 9, this is now the Mount of Transfiguration, um, beginning in verse 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these things, he took Peter, John and James and went up into a mount, mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. So here you see also these two anointed ones, right? The two witnesses, which is Moses and Elias, coming to Christ. And then here in verse 31, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, 
which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. So they were asleep right here, but when now Moses and Light came, came up, they wake, woke up, right? So right here they wake up, and then what do they see now? It says they saw his glory, they saw Christ's glory right here. And the two men that stood with him, the two anointed ones, right? So it's right this illustration, the two anointed one on each side and Christ in the middle in, in his glory. But this expression, they saw his glory, is also referring to Isaiah chapter 6, when he looks into the most holy place and sees the glory of the Lord. And when it says holy, holy, holy. And this you can sh show when you go to John chapter 12. It says here, uh, beginning in verse 38 to down to 41, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? And you can look it up for yourself. John chapter 12 yeah, is right here at the triumphal entry. Okay, and then John connects the triumphal entry now with, with what he says here. So right here, he ties in the triumphal entry with Isaiah 53, where it says, Lord, uh, who have believed our report, and when you go to Isaiah 53, it speaks about you know, the cross experience of Christ when he is you know, killed like a lamb, like when he's brought before his slaughter, and he died for his people. So he ties this here together, here with the triumphal entry, the midnight crime. And then in verse 39 he says, Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal him. This is now quoted from Isaiah chapter 6. And it says here, These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Okay, So Isaiah also saw right here at the midnight cry, the triumphal entry, he saw Christ's glory, like the disciples, when they wake up from their sleep, they see now Christ's glory. And they see also these two anointed ones, like Zechariah sees these two anointed ones and Christ in the middle. He also sees Christ's glory. So, when you turn back to Luke 9, you now verse 33, what happens when they wake up and see Christ's glory? It says, and it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. So also Peter, he doesn't know what he says, but he says here, let's build now three tabernacles here. So again, you can see right here that this, this building, you know, the beginning of the Raising up of God's temple or tabernacle is right mark, uh, is marked right here. Verse 34. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus found, was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. So, yeah, they have the Mara vision here, and, but they don't tell anybody here because when you go to Matthew, the parallel chapter, Jesus is the one telling them not to say anything about this vision that they received here. Matthew 17, verse 9, it says, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So, we can mark this also here. Where Jesus charges his disciples to tell no man. And we will find this now in our last illustration in Matthew 16. Let's go to Matthew 16 verses 13 to 20. So here it says the following. This is now where Peter confesses Christ. 
When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, and or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So here you also can see again the same illustration that now the Lord says upon this rock, uh, upon this foundation, this foundation stone, I will build my church in these three days, right, until it's completed here. And it's in connection with the confession that um, Peter made, because it says upon this rock, not referring to Peter, but to this confession that he made, that Christ is the Son of God. And then it's, it's interesting, now we can see the uh, comparison to uh, to the Mount of Transfiguration, and it says here, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was the Christ. So again, like on the Mount, he says no, tell no man of it. Okay, he charges his disciples not to tell anybody. And <clears throat> therefore you can see right here, you know, this is where the Lord puts in the foundation where he will build his church. He says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. And this confession of Christ is marked right here at the midnight cry. Because when you, you know, based upon all these evidence I showed you already, but you can also go to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, and there you can clearly also see that um, this is where the two classes will be manifested, you know, whether depending on whether they confess Christ or whether they deny him. The first epistle of John, you can show all that midnight cry where it speaks about uh, the children of the devil being manifested and the children of God being manifested. Cain killing Abel, for instance. And it says here now in verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And we understand false prophets are marked here based upon Matthew 24, and false prophets are marked here based upon Matthew 24. But he speaks now in First John about these false prophets. And it says here, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So here you have a spirit that confesseth Christ come in the spirit, uh, sorry, in the flesh, and this spirit is of God. This is Peter confessing Christ, and Christ says, Upon this rock I will build my church in these three days. And then in uh, verse 3, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Okay? So this is the demonstration of the two classes, the two spirits. The one that confessed Christ here, that he's come in the flesh, that means. Christ knew the hope of glory. You know, they, they confessed this first birth here, right? And also this exceeding bright light. But then this other group, they reject their past experience here. They reject this first birth and they reject, therefore, also this exceeding bright light. So right here, you have this confession of Christ mark and it's connected with this rock being laid, this foundation being laid, uh, in order to build up his church, which is completed right here. Okay, 
I hope that this was everything plain and clear to see and that we then also can locate these things correctly on our line, know where to place these stories and understand that the Lord is about to lay the foundation also in our time because we are standing shortly before our midnight cry here and <clears throat> are to experience this cross experience right here. So may the Lord give us the same spirit as Peter in confessing Christ here and, and giving by this the, the foundation through this confession for this church to be raised up here. Okay, let us uh, close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for all these different stories that harmonize so well and that clearly show us where you want to lay the foundation of your church in order to raise it up in within three days. And we ask you, Father, to help us to be partakers of this glorious work that is soon to, to come. And we ask you to give us the same understanding and spiritual understanding especially as Peter had when he confessed Christ. Please, Father, help us to hold fast to this message and to not deny and reject our past experience, but become partakers of this work where you will raise up your church and that we can become partakers of your church triumphant. And we praise you and thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.